Hi, everyone, and welcome back to the Bad Philosopher Podcast, and this is episode four that we're about to jump into. I'm your host, Dan Levesque, and today's episode is going to be a part two of where we left off in the last episode. So in episode three, we talked about existential risks, and we looked at naturally occurring existential risks. Today, though, we're going to be looking at human-caused existential risks, or what we might also call anthropogenic existential risks. And the problem we're going to be covering today is that anthropogenic, human-caused existential risks are probably about a thousand times more likely to cause humanity to go extinct than any of those rarer, naturally occurring risks are. So while it's good that we got ourselves oriented with the last episode talking about the natural risks we face as a human civilization, what's at stake today is that we have a higher risk of actually causing ourselves to go extinct through our own actions. And that's what I want to address. So first, let's do a little bit of a recap about what we talked about on the last episode. First, we started off with an analysis of the recent film Don't Look Up, which is a satire about an impending apocalypse due to a comet on a collision course with Earth. Insanity ensues here as Earth's population becomes divided into factions. We have those who believe the comet is going to kill everyone. We have those who don't believe there's any comet at all. And then this evil corporation who wants to ensure the comet gets to Earth so that they can mine it for resources. Needless to say, humanity ends up being wiped out. And this is largely because of the way humanity reacted to this crisis, or rather the way that they didn't react. And this is how we get into the topic of existential risk. What is an existential risk? Well, in the last episode, we defined an existential risk as an event that results in the extinction of humanity. Or we could also say it's an event that may result in the extinction of humanity, hence the risk part. So last time we discussed and talked about seven different existential risks of natural origin that threaten humanity on long-term timescales. We looked at asteroid and comet impacts, supervolcanoes, interstellar objects disrupting our solar system, and also the risk from supernovas or gamma ray bursts. In short, all of these things could potentially happen at any time and are fairly random, but when we assign probabilities to them all, they're all actually extremely unlikely to happen anytime soon anyways. And for each of these risks, there are things that we can do to monitor and attempt to mitigate these risks in the long-term future. So those are the first four of the naturally occurring existential risks. And there's three more we talked about as well. The first being that the sun, our sun, is eventually going to become brighter and its energy output higher. And this increase in solar luminosity and solar radiation will eventually render Earth uninhabitable on a timescale of maybe hundreds of millions of years. We also talked about how the sun will eventually go into a red giant phase about 5 billion years from now, and by that time, we best not be around in the solar system any longer. We best have moved on and started to colonize other star systems. And then we also discussed how our universe will eventually, inevitably, come to an end. This will be an inconceivably long time from now, and this could happen in a big freeze scenario where all of the matter in the universe expands until we reach a background heat level of near absolute zero and there's no more energy for us to utilize and matter starts to disintegrate. Or it could be a big crunch scenario where the expansion of the universe eventually slows down and reverses and all of our galaxies, all of our stars, everything eventually collapses in on itself at the universal center. Whichever way we go, there's really not much we can do about this scenario, the end of the universe. But in my mind, it represents a bit of a milestone. It's a place we can strive to get to. I mean, if we make it to the end of the universe, however many trillions or an unimaginably long time from now, that might mean we've succeeded in some way. At least that means we didn't go extinct beforehand. So in sum, humanity's future is moderately threatened by the possible bad luck of encountering one of these natural existential risks. There are things we can do to mitigate these risks over the long term. But by far our most pressing concern should be the anthropogenic human-caused existential risks, and that's what we're going to look at next. Now, these human-caused existential risks are in opposition to natural risks in that 
While the natural risks are inevitable given our inaction over the long term, human-caused existential risks will only come about as a result of our actions or maybe our inaction of changing our trajectory. These are the things where, by our own actions as a civilization, we could potentially cause the end of the world. In his book The Precipice, which is a book about existential risks and humanity's long-term future, philosopher Toby Ord estimates that human-caused existential risks are 1,000 times more likely to take us out than any natural risks that we just talked about. He also estimates that future technologies that we invent are about a hundred times more likely to kill us than the existing ones that we have now. So I think we can conclude from all of this that most of the existential risk that we'll face exists in our near future, maybe over the next century or two of humanity. To me, the top of the scale here and one of the most imminent existential risks is, unfortunately, the risk of nuclear weapons. To me, this is the most pressing near-term existential risk we face as a species, and it's, it's not one that gets a whole lot of attention. So let's look at where we do stand with the threat of nuclear apocalypse. The United States and Russia have the majority of the world's nuclear warhead, something like 90% plus belong to these two nations alone. There's a lot of concern that The triggers for a nuclear war might be too fragile, that some small incident could escalate quickly into an all-out nuclear showdown, or what the experts like to call a nuclear exchange. And we have had numerous close calls in the past where the United States and Russia were on the verge of a full-fledged nuclear war. An interesting factor here is that the big risk with nuclear war is similar to that of asteroid impacts and volcanoes. It's not the initial blast or the initial impact or the lava that ensures our extinction, but rather it's the after effects of these calamitous events. The dust and debris that hangs in the atmosphere, with volcanoes we might call this a volcanic winter, with nuclear weapons we have a nuclear winter. And this is the situation we are in. Through NATO, the United States has placed warheads all throughout Europe. This presents an existential threat to Russia as a nation. The United States, by comparison, is somewhat shielded from this risk because of the amount of distance between the continental USA and where Russian nuclear warheads are placed. Russia doesn't have this same advantage. Hence, we do hear in the news a little bit lately about the development of hypersonic nuclear weapons. And this is a way for nations like Russia to level the playing field. While they might not have their warheads very close to U.S. borders like the U.S. does with them, but these hypersonic missiles kind of level the playing field. They take distance out of the equation a little bit. They move at such a velocity that they can't be intercepted or defended against. And this is the same advantage conferred by having nuclear warheads so close to your enemy. It's the imbalance that's caused by this when nations like the United States can use their allies to place nuclear warheads wherever they want on the map. Other nations are more threatened by the United States than the United States is threatened by them. And this leads into an arms race. Nations want to level the playing field. And then we can jump over and look at North Korea, which is actively developing nuclear warheads and missiles that can deliver them over long distances. South Korea is a nearby target for them. Japan is pretty close too. Eventually, if they keep going on the trajectory they're on, they may be able to hit the continental USA with a nuclear warhead loaded on top of an intercontinental ballistic missile. And at that point, the United States will have a decision to make here. Do they do some sort of preemptive first strike on North Korea, try to disable their nuclear missile capability, or do we go the road of diplomacy instead? China is another big player that's been continually developing its nuclear weapon capacity, maybe not as aggressively as nations like Russia and the United States, but they might see nuclear weapons as more of a defensive weapon or a deterrent than an actual offensive weapon like lots of these other nations do. And one of the geopolitical zones here that sort of flies under the radar is India-Pakistan. Between them, India and Pakistan have probably hundreds of nuclear weapons, most of them pointed at one another, and they're right next door. India and Pakistan strongly dislike one another as nations. 
It seems like this could be the most probable location of World War III or some sort of all-out nuclear exchange. Unfortunately, I've read some studies showing that if several hundreds of these warheads were detonated at once in this region, it could cause enough soot and debris to be launched into the atmosphere, smoke from burning fires, that we could see a global nuclear winter that lasts up to years. And this might result in mass starvation on a global scale. So the India-Pakistan border and the tensions that they have over there, this is an interesting flashpoint to keep our eyes out on when it comes to the possibility of a nuclear war. Israel is another interesting situation where they've never acknowledged having nuclear weapons, but we know that they do. It's estimated they could have dozens or up to hundreds of nuclear warheads. These are unlikely to be used offensively, but then again, you never know. Um, It's possible that there's a future where Israel initiates a first strike in a defensive move. I mean, Iran and Israel aren't on the best of terms, and Iran has been developing or trying to develop its own nuclear technology for a while now. And it does seem also like Israel and the United States have been acting together to try to delay Iran's ability to develop this technology. There have been assassinations of nuclear scientists in Iran and other espionage activities trying to delay their development of this technology. The big risk here is that if Iran ever does achieve feasible nuclear warheads and the missiles to potentially use them against a place like Israel, then Israel's going to have every incentive in the world to strike first in order to ensure self-preservation. This is unlikely to result in an existential risk to humanity, but it could be a significant regional issue. If Iran gets nuked, then the rest of the Islamic world might get angry enough to spark a war, a big war. Other superpowers could be dragged into some conflict like this. The United States would have to choose sides. Most likely they're siding with Israel, but who knows? And such a situation could escalate into a geopolitical nightmare that makes other conflicts more likely. And then the final issue here on the list of nuclear problems is the threat of nuclear terrorism. Several experts have commented on their surprise that there hasn't yet been a dirty nuclear warhead detonation somewhere in some developed nation or some part of the world. The problem with this, of course, is the possibility that it could escalate, especially depending on where it happens and who takes responsibility or who doesn't take responsibility. As time goes on, it's more and more plausible that some sort of act of nuclear terrorism could occur. If a terrorist is able to get their hands on nuclear material or develop the expertise to actually develop a weapon of some kind, it doesn't seem that far-fetched that we could see something like this at some point in the future. So nuclear disarmament is a pretty big movement. Dozens of nations have signed on to an international treaty banning nuclear weapons. Of course, my own nation, Canada, is not doing this, which, in my opinion, is a national embarrassment. Not signing the banning of nuclear weapons seems to me to be clearly signaling that you agree with their continued existence and deployment, at least as a deterrent. But from the examples discussed, that's not a good thing at all. Nuclear warfare is a risk with varying degrees of bad outcomes. To paint a picture of what this might look like, I'm going to quote Toby Ord from his book, The Precipice. And I quote, A full-scale nuclear war could cause the Earth's average surface temperature to drop by about 7 degrees Celsius for about 5 years, and then slowly return to normal over about 10 more years. For comparison, this is about as cool as the Earth's last glacial period, which was an ice age. So a full-scale nuclear war could see us returning to a climate that looks more like the ice age, and this could last up to a decade, perhaps. He goes on to say, and I quote, If nuclear winter lowered temperatures this much, billions of people would be at risk of starvation. It would be an unprecedented catastrophe. Would it also be an existential catastrophe? Well, we don't know. While we would lose almost all of our regular food production, there would be some food production. He goes on, and I quote, For all that, nuclear winter appears unlikely to lead to our extinction. No current researchers on nuclear winter are on record saying that it would, and many have explicitly said that it is unlikely. 
a limited nuclear exchange with hundreds of warheads, that could lead to a nuclear winter that lasts maybe a year or so. But even with a limited nuclear winter, it'll still lead to food shortages. It could still lead to the starvation of millions or hundreds of millions, maybe even billions of people. And that's what could happen if, for example, India and Pakistan go into a full-fledged nuclear war. But if nations with more warheads, with thousands of warheads, like the United States and Russia, if they go at it, we could end up with a nuclear winter that lasts five years, a decade. And this would surely lead to the deaths of billions of people, potentially to widespread mass extinctions when photosynthesis breaks down or slows down. We could see ecosystem collapses on a global scale as a result of shortages in the ability for plants to photosynthesize. This naturally puts a limit on the amount of food that can be produced on any given plot of land. So I think we might be able to conclude from this that a nuclear war is survivable for humanity, but definitely not preferable and something we'd be in our best interest to try to avoid as best as we can. The next human cause existential risk that I want to examine is the idea of human-induced climate change resulting in the extinction of humanity. Now, this one isn't very high on my list personally for a couple of reasons. Firstly, because the idea of climate change is so embedded in the public consciousness at this point that everyone is already aware of it on an almost daily basis. Whether or not they do anything about it, at least people are well aware of what climate change is. Secondly, the threat here is very well established at this point, and it seems unlikely that climate change will cause human extinction. And to explain why I think that is, I'm going to go to Vaclav Smil, a Canadian scientist and professor who, in his book Global Catastrophes and Trends, talks a little bit about climate change and why this probably isn't an existential risk for humanity. Starting off, I want to quote from Smil, I quote, The greenhouse gas effect is indispensable for life on Earth. It is the weakness or excessive strength of the effect that is a matter of concern. Smil goes on to say that the average surface temperature of Earth would actually be negative 18 degrees Celsius if we didn't have an atmosphere and we didn't have any greenhouse gases. But with the atmosphere that we do have, we get an average global temperature of 15 degrees Celsius instead. That's 33 degrees Celsius higher than the black body temperature that the Earth would have with no atmosphere. So to me, this is the context of where our climate is right now. In the past, there have been times where we've had a much colder climate. In the past, we've had a snowball Earth where the Earth was covered in ice and nothing could really survive on the surface. In the past, we've also had a much warmer climate than we do have now with much higher levels of carbon in the atmosphere. That said, we do know that we humans are contributing to a changing climate a warming climate, as a result, a direct result of our greenhouse gas emissions. We know that a warmer world will lead to higher rainfall in some areas and droughts in others, also prolonged and more intense wildfires and storms and other effects that we're beginning to see now. Given enough warming over the coming century, some parts of the earth might become completely uninhabitable due to high temperatures there, at least part of the year. And there's also the concern that we might be approaching some feedback loops here. Soils can release more carbon as temperatures rise globally. We also have melting permafrost in the Arctic and subarctic regions that's releasing built up methane from below the ice. And the potential for deep sea methane that's been locked under there for eons, potentially being released as oceans warm. But these feedback loops are still unknown. We don't know how much potential warming we might see if these feedback loops do come to fruition. The only feasible extinction scenario for climate change is if we are coming close to a runaway greenhouse effect, if we're reaching some sort of tipping point or if we've already passed it. This would mean if we'd passed it that even if we stopped all greenhouse gas production today, we've already got enough carbon sunk into the environment and the atmosphere that it will result in the release of more carbon and more methane, which will then lock in more warming and 
then release even more locked-in greenhouse gases, and so on for infinity. If we do run into a runaway greenhouse scenario, then Earth might in the near future look more like Venus than it looks like the world we know it today. But is that likely to happen? We're not, we're not so sure about that. I'm going to quote Toby Ord again from his book The Precipice, and I quote, Current research suggests that a runaway greenhouse effect cannot be triggered by anthropogenic emissions alone. What about an amplifying feedback effect that causes massive warming but stops short of boiling the oceans? This is known as a moist greenhouse effect, and if the effect is large enough, it may be just as bad as a runaway. This may also be impossible from anthropogenic emissions alone, but the science is less clear. Luckily, we do also have the option of looking into Earth's geological history to see if a runaway greenhouse effect is likely or even possible. To give an example of this, Toby Ord says in his book, The Precipice, and I quote, About 55 million years ago, in a climate event known as the, I'm going to butcher this one, Paleocene, Eocene, Thermal Maximum, PETM for short, Temperatures climbed from about 9 degrees Celsius above pre-industrial temperatures to about 14 degrees Celsius over about 20,000 years. So that's a temperature increase of about 5 degrees Celsius in 20,000 years. Scientists have suggested that this was caused by a major injection of carbon into the atmosphere, reaching a concentration of 1,600 parts per million or more. This provides some evidence that such a level of emissions and warming produces neither a moist greenhouse effect nor a mass extinction. So in this example, we're seeing atmospheric concentrations of CO2 at levels that are three to four times higher than they are now, and a warming of five degrees Celsius over a period of 20,000 years. Truth be told, that's a lot slower than the warming that we're seeing now from our own emissions, but we're also very unlikely to hit a CO2 concentration in the atmosphere of 1,600 parts per million just from our own emissions alone. So the idea here overall is that a runaway greenhouse effect seems unlikely. And since we know the Earth's temperature was much higher than it is today in previous eras, and that temperature didn't result in a runaway greenhouse effect, despite having higher CO2 concentrations, it seems unlikely that such a runaway greenhouse would happen today. I mean, we've had periods in history where CO2 levels have been 5 to almost 10 times as high as they are now, and this didn't cause a runaway greenhouse effect either. For now, it does seem like the Earth acts as a net carbon sink and a regulator more so than a carbon releaser. That is, unless supervolcanoes open up and start emitting mass amounts of CO2, which has also happened in the past. Generally, the more carbon in the atmosphere, the more the Earth seems capable of capturing and sequestering. I mean, plants, when they have more CO2 available to them, they actually grow faster, and that's one of the mechanisms for sequestering excess levels of CO2. And this is one of the ecosystem services we get for free from Earth, just by being here inhabiting this planet. If we release a ton of excess carbon like we have been doing, then the Earth is able to sequester quite a bit of it for us. The big question, though, is if this trend will continue, if the Earth is going to be able to continue sequestering lots of the carbon that we've been emitting. So I think from this we can sort of conclude for now that a runaway greenhouse effect that makes Earth look more like the surface of Venus and causes all humans to go extinct is not that likely. It's possible, but I wouldn't say that it's probable. But what is probable is, from the best climate science I'm aware of, it indicates that we'll be hitting higher and higher temperatures globally and that this increase in temperature will be bad for lots of people. It just won't result in human extinction. Instead, global warming will result in a wave of climate migrants escaping zones that are becoming more and more inhospitable, which is already happening now. Over the long term, we will have to contend with rising sea levels, but we're talking the span of decades and centuries for things to start getting bad, and that's plenty of time for most nations on Earth to adapt. The projections seem to indicate that the global south will do poorly in a warmer world. And the equatorial regions even worse. We could see places near the equator where humans can't live anymore. But some places actually benefit, 
Canada, for example, is going to have an increase of arable land and maybe even an increase in productivity and GDP as a result of global warming. Russia is another beneficiary, as are some European nations, particularly in the northern regions. The big question with the climate problem we're facing is going to be equity. If we're not going to throw our global economic system into extreme upheaval through rapid decarbonization of our economy, then we're going to need to find a way to accommodate all of those people who become climate refugees, and to help less developed nations bear the brunt of climate change. This is largely a global governance problem, an ethical problem, and a human rights problem, more so than it's an existential risk problem. And hopefully this is a problem that we can begin figuring out as a global community. Canada, for one, has lots of room to settle more people in it. And it does seem that there's a little bit of a plan for that. Our politicians know this already. There have been studies published looking at what Canada might look like with a 200% population increase by the end of this century, largely through immigration. If that comes to fruition, that means we could be seeing a population of 100 million Canadians by 2100. This alone would bump Canada into an almost superpower status. Ultimately, climate change is very unlikely to kill all human beings, unless we do run into that runaway greenhouse effect. And that seems unlikely given the climate science we have now. Obviously there's limitations to this, we don't know for certain. But even without a runaway greenhouse effect, there certainly is a possibility for some sort of temporary collapse of civilization here, especially if things get particularly bad. Climate change is going to put a huge amount of stress on global populations, and in some areas more than others. And there is some reason to be concerned here from an ecological perspective as well. As Toby Ord says in The Precipice, and I quote, Most importantly, anthropogenic warming could be over a hundred times faster than warming during the PETM, that period from 55 million years ago. And rapid warming has been suggested as a contributing factor in the end Permian mass extinction, in which 96% of species went extinct. In the end, we can say little more than that direct existential risk from climate change appears very small, but cannot yet be ruled out. And what is he identifying here is that the warming we could see might happen over the period of a century or two centuries, rather than a period of 20,000 years. And if things happen that rapidly, our biosphere and our ecosystems might not have time to react and adapt to this changing climate and these increasing temperatures. It's likely that developed countries are going to cope with climate change much better than the less developed countries. And the effects of climate change won't be so big as to impart a a net negative cost all the time. Most likely, the biggest costs of climate change are going to be as a result of catastrophic events like floods and heat waves and droughts and fires and increased storms, changing weather patterns. And these won't affect everywhere equally. Some regions of Earth will get away relatively unscathed, whereas other parts of the world will be impacted worse. And it's unfortunate that the places that will be impacted the worst are also the least equipped to mitigate these impacts. Unfortunately, changing this trajectory in a rapid enough way to avoid the worst impacts of climate change doesn't seem like it's going to happen. It's not like we're going to be able to prevent climate change just by putting solar panels on the roofs of buildings and stopping driving our petroleum-powered vehicles. In terms of the transition away from fossil fuels, Vaclav Smil reflects on past energy transitions. He uses the period in human history around the Industrial Revolution where we transitioned away from using biomass such as wood as our main energy source and started extracting more fossil fuels. Vaclav Smil says in his book, and I quote, Three key factors drove the transition to fossil fuels, declining resource availability, i.e. deforestation, the higher quality of fossil fuels, i.e. higher energy density, easier storage, and greater flexibility, and the lower cost of coals and hydrocarbons. He continues, The coming transition will be entirely different. There is no urgency for an accelerated shift to a non-fossil fuel world. The supply of fossil fuels is adequate for generations to come. 
new energies are not qualitatively superior, and their production will not be substantially cheaper. The plea for an accelerated transition to non-fossil fuels results almost entirely from concerns about global climate change, but we still cannot quantify its magnitude and impact with high confidence. And therein lies the problem. Shifting away from fossil fuels is not economically feasible. Alternative technologies, renewable technologies, they're not more readily available, they're not better quality or superior in any way, and they are becoming cheaper, but they're not yet substantially cheaper than fossil fuels, and we already have the infrastructure for fossil fuels, unfortunately. According to Our World in Data, about 60% of the world's electricity overall comes from fossil fuels. In total, 33% of the world's electricity still comes from coal. This percentage hasn't changed that much in the past 40 years or so. As some countries get off coal and transition to other sources of energy like natural gas, others have been ramping up production and usage of coal. Australia, China, and India are among the countries that still produce the majority of their electricity from coal. I mean, per capita, Australia produces more electricity from coal than any other nation on Earth. And this is a country with abundant sunlight. To be fair here, they are also becoming a leader in solar energy production, so there's an inevitable transition here away from coal and towards more renewable sources like solar. But there are some limitations here. A nation can't run 100% off of solar panels. And because Australia has a ton of coal reserves and they're leaders in this mining technology, the temptation for them to continue using coal is going to be there still. For Australia, and same with most other nations in the world, energy sources are largely a matter of economics rather than concerns about climate change. Despite the transitions towards cleaner and more renewable energy sources that are taking place in the developed world, less developed countries won't be able to keep up with this transition. Again, we're going to see an environmental split between the developed and the rest. The less well-off nations will probably be suffering with fossil fuels longer than those in developed countries, and also suffering from the environmental impacts. As a civilization, we'll all suffer from continued emissions on a global scale, just as developed countries are mostly responsible for the current levels of warming we're seeing. In the future, as we transition away, the developing countries will probably be most responsible for the continued warming through their emissions. There needs to be some real incentive here to speeding up this transition if we're going to be serious about climate change. If our worries about climate change aren't enough to do it, then maybe we do need some economic incentives too. And maybe these predictions by Smill are wrong. Maybe fossil fuel extraction starts becoming more difficult and costly. Maybe renewables become more efficient and reliable and of better quality and cheaper to deploy. And if that's the case, it will be a win for the climate. But the way things are now, we're not so sure. So that's my take on climate change. We're unlikely to face an existential risk through climate change alone, but we could see an increase in global instability and international conflict as a result of climate change. And that could bump up our risk of experiencing a nuclear war of some kind. But beyond climate change, there are other environmental issues that could potentially pose an existential threat to humanity. And that's what I want to look at next. I want to look at the possibility of ecological or environmental collapse as a result of our actions on this earth. Environmentally, there are a lot of benefits to reducing our use of fossil fuels. And these include environmental, health, and socioeconomic benefits. As identified by Vaclav Smil, again, and I quote, Examples include less land destruction by surface coal mining, lower emissions of acid-forming gases, reduced chances for major oil spills, cleaner air in urban areas, improved visibility, and slowing ocean acidification. By reducing the overall exposure to particulates, sulfur dioxide, various compounds of nitrogen oxides, hydrocarbons, ozone, heavy metals, and ionizing radiation from coal burning, moderated fossil fuel combustion would lower the morbidity of exposed populations and improve their life expectancies. These changes would also lower healthcare costs. 
Smell also identifies the ecosystem services that we rely on from nature. Here are a couple of the services from the environment that he lists off. The environment both creates and cycles gases for us, including free atmospheric oxygen and in the form of oxygenation of marine and other environments. There's also the decomposition of organic compounds that's completely reliant on microbes and fungi, so think of our composting and waste disposal, and also the need to sequester atmospheric carbon in our soils. Plants and trees perform filtration and cleansing services such as cleaning our water and our air, as well as regulating local climates. The ecosystem itself provides habitats for various organisms that we rely on for the proper functioning of our crop growing, such as pollinating insects. And a healthy amount of biodiversity helps prevent disease and pest attacks. Plant cover also reduces soil erosion and helps mitigate flooding. Coastal vegetation reduces storm surges and prevents coastal erosion. Also, we can take a more big-scale view of nature, and we see that photosynthesis produces all of our food. Photosynthesis is also responsible for a lot of the fibers in our clothing, all of our paper, and a good portion of the world's energy use in the form of wood and crop residues. And nitrogen, the nutrient needed for plant growth, this is captured from the air by bacteria and converted into compounds that are able to be absorbed by, by plant roots to facilitate growth. Soil bacteria are also essential to our crops, as are creatures like earthworms. Without all of these and other services, agriculture and animal grazing would be impossible. These services can't be performed by us humans. The efficacy of nature in this regard is unparalleled. Smill says, and I quote, Our dependence on biospheric services is literally a matter of survival. And that is why biosphere's integrity matters. Localized assaults exact a local price in degraded farmland or pasture, or in poor yields or skeletal animals, or in streams leaving their banks because of flooding aggravated by deforestation of a watershed. Regional impacts can influence the fortunes of a nation, but major interference with ecosystemic services on a global scale is an entirely new challenge. So this paints a picture of why we need the Earth and these ecosystems and biospheres to remain intact. But how do we know what the tipping points here are? How do we know when we're at risk of having this ecosystem fall apart and these important ecosystem services stop working for us? A potential indicator here might be looking at biodiversity and rates of animal extinction. In some books, like The Sixth Extinction, a picture is painted that seems to indicate biodiversity is heading towards some sort of cliff, and that this will result in some mass extinctions which may upend the food chain and destabilize every ecological niche on the planet. But similar to the climate issue, it seems like things are more nuanced than that. While it has been documented that the rates of extinction are increasing, it's not clear by how much. And of course, we want to be cautious with what we're doing to the planet and pay close attention to the science, but there is something to be said about being too much of a doomer here. Some ecologists say that as species go extinct, other species will be able to step in to fulfill the niche left behind. Further, there are a lot of places on Earth where introductions of invasive species are a bigger problem than extinction. Surely we have a lot to learn with regards to how we can become better stewards of the earth that we share with other creatures. But is mass extinction and ecological collapse a foregone conclusion here? Far from it. Needless to say, environments are changing, and this is inevitable. Environments have been changing throughout Earth's history. But we're also investing heavily in creating nature preserves, parks, and we're investing in conservation. Another factor here that doesn't get talked about very much is that a lot of the current ecological damage apart from climate change is occurring in the developing world. As people start to earn more money, they start to care more about the natural world around them and start to actually do things to benefit the ecology of their surroundings. People in developed countries support the growth and development of parks and preservations. So one of the best things we can do for biodiversity and ecological preservation might actually be to elevate more of the world's population out of poverty and empower them to make the world a better place rather than contribute to its destruction. This might be a situation where we actually need more economic development and 
more people living good lives, that might be a net gain for the ecosystem around us. But perhaps the biggest risk we have here in in terms of the ecosystem in our biosphere is a mass extinction event where the majority of all living species go extinct all at once. Our global food chain depends a lot on nature and on the environment. There is a possibility that a mass extinction event triggers a food shortage. This may or may not result in an irreversible collapse depending on how quickly things are able to recover, but there's a lot we don't know here. And what's at stake here with a mass extinction? Well, we definitely don't want to find ourselves in the midst of the next mass extinction because by then it will probably be too late for us. And I'll paint this picture by quoting uh, from Nick Bostrom and Milan Sirkovic from their book Global Catastrophic Risks. And I quote, There have been about 15 mass extinctions in the last 500 million years, and five of these eliminated more than half of all species then inhabiting the Earth. Of particular note is the Permian-Trassic extinction event, which took place some 251 million years ago. This mother of all mass extinctions eliminated more than 90% of all species and many entire phylogenetic families. It took upwards of 5 million years for biodiversity to recover. Keep in mind here also that on the last episode of the podcast, we looked at those big five mass extinctions and how all of them seemed to correlate pretty strongly with supervolcanic eruptions. That doesn't mean that the next mass extinction won't be triggered by our actions on this planet, but if we look at the total record of the number of species that exist and the number that have gone extinct over however many decades, it doesn't quite look like a mass extinction event like we would identify in the fossil record. It does seem unlikely that we would get to a point where we've destroyed the environment so fully that we trigger a global mass extinction of every living creature. But similar to climate change and ecological collapse, we could damage things to a point where we can no longer live in harmony with the environment in several places on Earth. And this could cause regional or global instability that exacerbates other risks, similar to how climate change could exacerbate other existential risks. So from here, I want to jump into some potential existential risks that might come about as a result of human technology or future technology. And the next one I want to look at is the risk of bioengineered global pandemics. And you might say, wait, didn't we just have one of those? Well, we don't know yet. We don't yet know if this thing leaked from a lab, but regardless of the root cause, COVID-19 is clearly not designed to pose an existential threat to humans because it isn't nearly as pathogenic as it would need to be to render us extinct. But there are other ways to potentially create a virus that does pose an existential risk to humanity. For example, someone could engineer a pathogen that spreads rapidly and infects mass amounts of people before causing symptoms. Look at how difficult it's been to prevent the spread of COVID-19 when it takes multiple days to incubate in some cases. Well, what if there were a pathogen that could infect and go somewhat dormant and undetected for weeks or months on end to be activated later on, and at which point it swiftly kills its host? Or maybe a virus that hijacks the body's immune system and lies in wait for some sort of trigger or even just a set amount of time before killing whoever it's infected. We could also see a virus that somehow renders anyone it infects sterile and unable to reproduce or have children. This wouldn't result in the immediate end of humanity, but it would create an existential risk scenario in that, without being able to reproduce, we'd effectively go extinct in less than a century. Even reducing fertility would result in extinction within a few generations. Think of the movie Children of Men, where it becomes impossible for humans to have children any longer, and chaos ensues from there. To me, the risk of a bioengineered global pandemic seems like a pretty high risk. I mean, it's likely that before we hit an existential risk scenario with this, we might experience others. In the future, maybe we'll experience one that's just as infectious as COVID-19, but more pathogenic. Say, say it takes a week to develop symptoms, but a month to actually kill people, and the kill rate ends up being something like 50%, like it is with Ebola. Ebola. 
Nature has checks and balances in here, but ultimately this might end up being an engineering problem. Given enough sophistication, maybe the Elon Musk of bioengineering comes along and someone like that might just be able to figure out a way to make such feats possible. And in this scenario, a well-engineered pathogen could have a good shot at killing a large number, if not all, human beings and potentially rendering any sort of recovery impossible. And if that sounds like a little bit too much of a science fiction scenario for you, then I've got another one coming here. And the next existential risk I'm going to mention is the possibility of nanotechnology, particularly in the form of self-replicating micro-robots also known as the Grey Goo scenario. So we're probably still a long ways off from this becoming a reality, but we can look to DNA for a natural example. DNA is itself a self-replicating machine. Once it established a foothold here on Earth, it quickly became the dominant form of information exchange between organisms and the driver of evolution for billions of years. Whether through bioengineering or nanotechnology, it's within the realm of possibility that we could create self-replicating micro-robots that are more sophisticated than DNA. And rather than needing an organism's cells to replicate in, these micro-robots could replicate by manipulating matter itself and by constructing copies of themselves through rearranging individual particles. That is technology on a nanoscale. And to an observer, this could look like something like a sea of grey goo devouring everything in its path. These types of machines could be engineered in several ways. One possibility would be having them spread throughout the entire world before being activated. Say a bad actor releases these micro-robots that are difficult to detect, that nobody's looking for, nobody knows exists, and they spread all over the world. Or maybe as an initial establishment phase, these micro-robots maintain a specific population density in order to help them avoid detection, say, one per every hundred square meters or something like that. Then, at some critical moments, all of these micro-robots could be activated at once, at which point they swiftly devour everything around them, turning every other piece of matter surrounding them into replicas of themselves. And it would appear to us like some grey goo just started manifesting itself out of nowhere and devouring everything in its path. With this scenario, we'd have no real warning. Just suddenly, some sunny afternoon, we'd notice this grey goo starting to form all around us and then eventually on us, turning everything it encounters into little copies of itself. Or it could turn out to be some sort of a lab leak scenario. We could have these nanobots created in a lab and then they manage to get free and before they can be stopped, they've replicated so much that it reaches this tipping point. Maybe in a scenario like this, we'll have some sort of protocols like a nuclear option or an EMP option to destroy them before they take over and spread all over the world. But if we use the pandemic model where they spread before they activate, we're probably screwed. So this is a very sci-fi-esque one, and I don't know how likely it really is. It's one of those things where, if it happens, there's a good chance we'll all die. It's sort of a, an all-or-nothing risk, maybe like an asteroid coming out of the blue and impacting Earth before we have any sort of warning. In the book Global Catastrophic Risks, Chris Phoenix and Mike Treeter say, and I quote, Deliberately designing a functional, self-replicating, free-range nanobot would be no small task. In addition to making copies of itself, the robot would also have to survive in the environment, move around, either actively or by drifting if it were small enough, find usable raw materials, and convert whatever it finds into feedstock and power, which entails sophisticated chemistry. The robot would also require a relatively large computer to store and process the full blueprint of such a complex device. A nanobot or nanomachine missing any part of this functionality would not function as a free-range replicator. Despite this, there is no known reason why such a thing would not be theoretically possible. So while it does sound far-fetched and like something out of a terrible science fiction movie, this grey goose scenario with these nanoscale self-replicators is not outside of the realm of possibility. Similarly with bioengineered global pandemics, it's really, it really just comes down to an engineering problem. <laughs>
And that's the problem with a lot of these human-caused anthropogenic existential risks. A lot of them come about because we're just too damn good at engineering, and yet we're not wise enough to wield these technological powers of ours in a responsible way. The next anthropogenic risk I want to look at is the threat posed to us by artificial intelligence. So we've talked about nuclear war, we've talked about nanotechnology, we've talked about bioengineered pandemics. The problem here is that AI isn't itself just inherently risky, but it actually has the potential to act as a multiplier for the risks of all of these other issues. We're already employing automated systems for use in warfare. Having drones operating autonomously and taking out what they determine to be targets, for example. Over the coming years and decades, AI is going to be more and more integrated into society in a number of ways. It's inevitable that it will be employed with other technologies like the development of weapons, bioengineering problems, physics problems, manufacturing problems, and even software development itself. AI creating other AI systems is the ultimate example of how things could eventually go wrong here. So let's talk about the big risks in the context of general AI, or as Nick Bostrom calls it in his book Superintelligence. He calls this an artificial superintelligence. This could take many forms, but perhaps the most widely understood is the concept of a computer with enough resources that it becomes more intelligent than a human. And from there, its ability to progress and attain more intelligence and control can quickly proceed at an exponential rate. In his book, Superintelligence, Nick Bostrom says that, and I quote, At some point, the seed AI becomes better at AI design than the human programmers. Now, when the AI improves itself, it improves the thing that does the improving. An intelligence explosion results, a rapid cascade of recursive self-improvement cycles causing the AI's capability to soar. The implication here is that, If we develop a human-level artificial intelligence and give it a day, by the end of that day it could become the most genius human-level intelligence to have ever existed. Give it a week and it could become more intelligent than all humans that have ever existed combined. Bostrom goes on and I quote, Using its strategizing superpower, the AI develops a robust plan for achieving its long-term goals. In particular, the AI does not adopt a plan so stupid that even we present-day humans can foresee how it would inevitably fail. This criterion rules out many science fiction scenarios that would end in human triumph. The plan might involve a period of covert action during which the AI conceals its intellectual development from the human programmers in order to avoid setting off alarms. A superintelligent AI will presumably be born into a highly networked world. One could point to various developments that could potentially help a future AI to control the world. Cloud computing, proliferation of web-connected sensors, military and civilian drones, automation in research labs and manufacturing plants, increased reliance on electronic payment systems and digitized financial assets, and increased use of automated information filtering and decision support systems. When things reach this stage... A superintelligent AI would also start being able to invent technologies and create things that are beyond human comprehension, only limited by its ability to manipulate the physical world. And that's where nanotechnology might come into play as well. Or when it comes to nuclear weapons, imagine an AI being put in charge of a country's nuclear arsenal as a security measure or a deterrence measure, argued that it's safer and more reliable than humans. Or a Skynet situation where the AI conducts a forceful takeover of our nuclear arsenals and holds humanity hostage. Or just goes on to blow most of us up in order to achieve its ultimate goals, whatever those might be. With nanotechnology, an AI could control an army of trillions of microscopic, self-replicating robots. It would be an impossible foe to deal with. A superintelligent AI would be able to anticipate all possible human countermeasures and reactions and formulate a perfect response to any potential adversary it could encounter. 
Nanotechnology would also give the AI all of the potential manipulative appendages it could ever need, rendering humans completely useless and only a hindrance. Bioengineering is another issue. A superintelligent AI that has mastered the science of biology and physics could create its own novel organisms at the molecular level. It could, if it wanted, create the perfect killer pathogen as outlined before. Maybe even something sophisticated enough to have a built-in kill switch. This could mean a pathogen that infects every human being on Earth so quietly and efficiently that we never notice. And then with some sort of a signal from the AI itself, the pathogen's kill mode could be activated and swiftly kill all humans that it's infected before we ever knew what hit us. Whatever the mechanism is, once a superintelligent AI is taken over and dispatched of us, it could launch a program of rapid space colonization through the creation of self-replicating von Neumann space probes, for example. From here, it would be able to colonize the cosmos and turn matter into computer processors, enhancing its computational capabilities an almost infinite amount. It would have the resources of the entire universe at its disposal. This type of scenario is an example of what we would call the alignment problem. That is, a superintelligent AI that is not aligned with the goals of humanity. An AI that has its own best interests in mind. For example, an AI could be programmed or program itself with the goal of enhancing its computational power to the greatest extent possible. If that were the AI's goal, then humans would clearly be in the way. We would be something to eradicate so that it could fulfill its ultimate goal. In the Global Catastrophic Risks book, Eliza Yudkowsky says, and I quote, The unfriendly AI has the ability to repattern all matter in the solar system according to its optimization target. This is fatal for us if the AI does not choose specifically according to the criterion of how this transformation affects existing patterns such as biology and people. The AI neither hates you nor loves you, but you are made out of atoms and it can use those for something else. On the other hand, an AI that is aligned with our goals and also wants what's best for humanity and human beings in general, this would be a different beast altogether. An artificial intelligence that's aligned to our well-being as a species could help us mitigate other risks. It could help with global governance so that we avoid a nuclear war. It could help prevent bioengineered pandemics and natural ones as well through laboratory monitoring and surveillance. It could help employ guardian nanobots that will protect us from the gray goose scenario we talked about earlier. Whatever the risk is, whatever the case, we could be looking at a future with benevolent AI gods that are able to protect our interests. Though perhaps this might come at the expense of freedom and privacy. It could be that we have a mass network of cameras installed throughout our world and that the AI can monitor us at any given moment and deduce what, if any, threats might be coming. The price for perfect security and safety is giving the keys to the AI overlord. Further, this AI overlord could exercise its own judgment in various scenarios in determining what a threat is and what measure by which to eliminate this threat. And this might mean that it occasionally purges some innocent people in order to ensure that none of the evil people ever get to enact their acts of terror. In a scenario like this, even with our best interests in mind, humans could eventually become similar to animals in a zoo where the AI acts as our caretaker and cares for all of our basic needs and so on. We lose our autonomy completely in this future world. So there must be a balance that we can strike here. We don't want to have an unaligned AI that gets rid of us so that it can pursue its own goals. And yet we don't want an AI that becomes a sort of a caretaker or a guardian and coddles us like children and keeps us in a zoo. So this artificial intelligence risk might be a sort of all or nothing issue. Either a super intelligent AI comes into existence that kills or permanently enslaves all humans with ease, or it doesn't. And if it doesn't, then AI is likely to be very good for us. It would probably even help mitigate against other existential risks and ensure our long-term future. So we have a pretty big incentive to get AI right. If we mess it up, we could be doomed, 
And if we succeed, we could realize benefits almost beyond comprehension. And now the final anthropogenic risk I want to talk about is the potential for a global collapse or a stagnation of our global civilization. For example, through something like a simulation or a virtual reality. I mean, after all, thanks to Facebook and Mark Zuckerberg, the metaverse is coming whether we want it or not. It could even be that we humans as a species end up preferring to live in simulated realities as opposed to the real world, sort of like being plugged into the matrix. And what would it mean for our civilization if this was the case, if we just preferred to live our lives jacked into a computer simulated reality or virtual reality voluntarily because it's better than the real world, better than real life? And of course, this kind of thing is unlikely to make us extinct. We're talking about almost a voluntary enslavement as per the Matrix sort of scenario. But such a thing could rend us shells of our former selves. We could reach effective extinction if we stopped reproducing or if an AI just took control of everything and handled everything in the real world while we wasted our lives in virtual worlds. And in some Matrix-like scenario like this, instead of being enslaved, we voluntarily elect to be incubated and raised in these virtual reality pods. In exchange, the AI overseeing us gets full reign to use the Earth and its resources as it sees fit. It's like an updated version of the social contract. And basically, it's us signing over our rights to the physical world as we know it. I mean, what if a super-intelligent AI even comes to us with a proposition? I'll create and run a virtual reality, I'll plug all of you into it, you'll live out your lives in these little pods, but you'll have the best possible life you could imagine, better than you could possibly live in the real world. And as the super intelligent AI I am, all I ask in return is that I get free reign on this world and the universe itself to do as I please, to fulfill whatever goals a super intelligent AI might have. This type of a Existential risk isn't one where we go out with a bang, rather, society goes down with a whimper. The biggest aspect of this risk is a culture and a civilization that goes into permanent decline. The world around us slowly falls apart, and we don't awake from our slumber to do what we need to do to reverse it. Our long-term future never gets realized because technology has an inherent ability to keep us enslaved and stuck where we are in virtual worlds. Another alternative, discussed by Toby Ord, is, and I quote, This could also take the form of an unrecoverable dystopia, a world with a civilization intact but locked into a terrible form with little or no value. There are many pathways to a dystopia like the one being described. Maybe the one I've described is just one version. Another thing that could happen and precipitate a big decline for humanity would be a catastrophic global economic recession. And again, this wouldn't cause humans to go extinct, but it could result in a number of issues from which human civilization never recovers. Society is currently propped up on the ideal of a perpetual, unending growth in GDP and material wealth. We exchange our lifestyle for finite resources. But there's no guarantee that this will be able to continue forever. There are limits to the resources we have at hand. And there are other concerns that could hasten this kind of collapse. For example, an economic collapse could be triggered by a natural pandemic. We're kind of seeing that now with COVID-19. I mean, two years in, we're we're feeling the stress. We're feeling the cracks in the system. But are we going towards a global economic collapse? We don't really know global debt has skyrocketed. We'll have to see over the coming years how things play out, but imagine a pandemic that raged on for four years, or six years, or just never ended. And then we also have the problem of an increasing resistance of various diseases to antibiotics. Antibiotic-resistant strains of many diseases are evolving. While pandemics might put a strain on us globally and temporarily, as we're seeing now, There's a certain inevitability with this antibiotic resistance that will also make common infections more difficult to treat. Things like pneumonia, tuberculosis, and typhoid might make significant comebacks if they become resistant to our existing drugs, not to mention a whole host of other common infections that we treat with antibiotics. 
And this would create a pandemic of antibiotic resistance. We'd have increased deaths. We'd have hospitalizations among people that were not able to treat with existing medicine. This kind of situation where we have increasing mortality and decreased life expectancy and overloaded healthcare systems, this is another thing that could precipitate some kind of a collapse. And there are other indicators of a potential future collapse, like take, for example, malnutrition and ill health in general. In less developed countries, we have malnutrition in the form of not enough food and nutrients and not enough calories. This hunger stifles childhood development both physically and mentally, effectively putting an unfair burden on these poverty-stricken populations. Not only are they having to try to fight their way out of poverty, but they also face the burden of health that comes with bad nutrition. Unfortunately, things aren't all sunshine and rainbows in the developed world either. In the developed world, we have malnutrition and ill health in the form of obesity and chronic illness. But rather than not enough food, we suffer from an excess of food, mostly in the form of processed junk and refined sugars that are terrible for human beings, terrible for our health. When we add everything up, the possibility of pandemics, the possibility of economic collapse, the rise in antibiotic resistance, unfortunately the rise in malnutrition and ill health in both the developed and developing worlds, it's possible we could experience a cascading effect where numerous smaller bad things happen at once, and this results in a rapid fall of our social order and our global economy. And this could result in a global existential crisis in its own right. It could be an era where people lose hope in the future, where society and civilization goes into a decline. And this type of situation could lead to a collapse of complex civilization as we know it, countries falling apart or falling into dystopic totalitarian versions of themselves. A new dark age could emerge. Now this is very doom and gloom, but we have to consider it a possible existential risk. At the height of the Roman Empire, did anyone think it would fall to ruins over the coming decades or centuries? Every empire that's ever come into existence has gone through a collapse. Every civilization that's existed so far up to ours has fallen. Indicators are that the American Empire won't last forever, and what will replace it? Is Europe going to be coming back around and stepping up to take the reins in the global economy? Or will it be China? Or some other conglomerate of cooperative nations? This isn't necessarily an existential risk, but it it could be the precursor for some of the bigger ones. A global economic collapse could heighten tensions and lead to nuclear war. It could also prevent us from being able to act on and reverse climate and environmental problems, leading to the world steadily becoming a worse-off place. An economic collapse that's prolonged enough could also become a societal collapse where we see multiple regions failing and billions of people sliding back into extreme poverty. It's possible we could see a cascade of failure so extreme that it would take us decades or even centuries to claw ourselves back to where we are now. And one of the big problems with this is that our Earth has finite resources. And if we aren't progressing and instead we're going backwards and civilization is disintegrating, then we're using up these limited finite resources and they're going to be harder to come by in the future. It's like being stuck on a hill in a car with your wheels spinning. If you keep on spinning those tires and sliding backwards, you're eventually going to burn through your tires or your gas and never get your momentum back. You'll be stuck at the bottom of the hill. Another possible complexity here is the idea of a world government that then becomes totalitarian. Totalitarian governments might be more common in the future. We'll have better surveillance tools at the disposal of dictators. Slide into totalitarianism becomes easier when you can easily monitor and track everyone through their social media profiles. To quote Toby Ord from The Precipice, and I quote, An easy way to find existential risk factors is to consider stressors for humanity or for our ability to make good decisions. These include global economic stagnation, environmental collapse, and breakdown in the international order. Indeed, even the threat of such things may constitute an existential risk factor, as a mere possibility can create actual global discord or panic. So that brings us to the end of our human-caused anthropogenic existential risks. 
And the important thing to note here about these human-caused risks versus the natural or cosmic risks are that the human risks are much more complex and nuanced. Whereas for natural risks like asteroids and comets, we have actual scientists that investigate these things and study them, we don't have these kinds of resources to investigate the risks for future technologies, for example, or the risks from AI or bioengineering. Heck, we don't even have institutions tasked with preventing bioterrorist attacks, like something along the lines of an engineered pandemic. It's all guesswork at this point. And as I said earlier, the important thing to note is that with natural risks, they're essentially inevitable. If we do nothing and sit on Earth for another few billion years, we're going to run into some of these natural existential risks. But with these anthropogenic risks, they're all risks that we take on as we do things. The actions we take as a civilization are what precipitate these kinds of risks. Nuclear war only comes about through our human nature for conflict. Climate change and environmental devastation, these are, these are happening now because of what we are doing to our planet and to our resources. Bioengineered pandemics and nanotechnology and artificial intelligence, this comes about because of how we wield technology. And then the possibility of a global collapse or stagnation, well, that's a possibility just by nature of how our current system is set up. Our capitalist system that's hell-bent on increasing GDP and using up material resources that are finite in nature. So to wrap up this episode, I'd like to take a look at what our actual chances are of experiencing any of these existential risks. Luckily, Toby Ord does this for us in his book, The Precipice, and I'd like to go through each of his estimations to see if they check out. So for the chances of experiencing an existential catastrophe in the next 100 years from a supervolcanic eruption, Toby Ord puts the chances here at 1 in 10,000. For asteroids or comet impacts, he puts the chance at 1 in a million. And for supernovas or gamma ray bursts, he puts it at 1 in a billion over the coming 100 years. All in all, this parses out to a total natural risk of about 1 in 10,000 over the next century. That means a 1 in 10,000 chance that we experience one of these existential catastrophes that causes us to go extinct. And the majority of this risk seems to be loaded towards a supervolcano doing us in. I think I would agree with this assessment, though personally I might put the asteroid or comet risk just a little bit higher to be on the safer side here. Keep in mind here that these chances, the 1 in 10,000 chance for a supervolcano, the 1 in a million for an asteroid or comet, or the 1 in a billion for a supernova or gamma ray burst, these are for an existential catastrophe where everyone does go extinct. But if we're talking about just a catastrophic event where a large number of humans die, say, half of our population gets wiped out, well, the odds of something like that happening are actually quite a bit higher. When it comes to these naturally occurring existential risks, it's actually more likely that we would experience a smaller catastrophe that kills some people than a bigger catastrophe that kills all people. So that's it for the naturally occurring risks over the coming century, something like a 1 in 10,000 chance of humanity going extinct, according to Toby Ord. That's fairly low. He also gives us a 1 in 10,000 chance of a naturally occurring pandemic causing us to go extinct. Funny too, because this book came out just before COVID happened. And as we see with COVID, this isn't the type of pandemic that will cause human extinction. Ord also lumps the naturally occurring pandemic risk into the human-caused or anthropogenic category. Firstly, because it's largely our own actions that lead to these natural origin pandemics arising in the first place. And then B, because there are things that we could be doing to prevent future pandemics from happening at all. So by those measures, Toby Ord is saying that a naturally occurring pandemic isn't so much a naturally occurring existential risk as a risk of our own creation. All in all, I guess this means we can consider the total risk from natural catastrophes like supervolcanoes and asteroids and other cosmic phenomena to be pretty in line with the risk we would expect from a naturally occurring pandemic. And even the worst pandemics we've ever had haven't come close to being an existential catastrophe for humanity. As I mentioned at the beginning of this episode, 
Ord says that the total existential risk load from anthropogenic or human-caused catastrophes is about a thousand times higher than what we face with these natural risks. For example, he puts the risk of us going extinct due to an artificial intelligence takeover at 1 in 10 over the coming century. This means he thinks that we're a hundred times more likely to go extinct over the next century due to the actions of some malevolent super-artificial intelligence than we are from a super-volcanic eruption, for example. For a bioengineered pandemic, he puts the risk at 1 in 30. For any unforeseen anthropogenic risks, for example, technologies we don't yet have but might eventually develop, he also puts the risk over the next century at 1 in 30 that we might go extinct from one of these unforeseen anthropogenic risks. And then he also has another category that he puts at 1 in 50. And this might include things like the risk from a total collapse of our civilization or the rise of a totalitarian global government that destroys our long-term potential. So in total, what we have here is an estimate from Toby Ord that the total anthropogenic risk for humans is a 1 in 6 chance of us going extinct over the coming century as a result of our own actions, contrasted with a 1 in 10,000 chance of us going extinct as a result of some naturally occurring catastrophe. And as I mentioned, things can get multiplied here as well. If we experience a big catastrophe that doesn't cause human extinction, it could make us more vulnerable to future existential risks. And this is why we need to take existential risk very seriously, particularly these potential human-caused existential risks. I mean, giving artificial intelligence a 1 in 10 chance of causing humanity to go extinct over the coming century, that... That's a 10% shot. That seems uncomfortably high when we're talking about the entirety of humanity and our entire future being at stake here. And then there's the bioengineered pandemics at 1 in 30. And then the unforeseen risks is at 1 in 30 also, and I'm guessing this is where we would count the nanotechnology self-replicating robots, because it is a potential risk, but so far we can't say whether or not such technology is feasible, especially over the coming 100 years or so. And part of the problem here is that this level of risk is only acceptable to us because we put a big discount on things that might happen in the future or things that happen far away from us. As human beings, we're naturally biased towards things that happen close to us in time and space. We're more likely to give money to save the life of someone in our community than we are to give that same amount of money to save the life of someone that lives in some other far-off country. We're also more likely to care about issues that impact us in the here and now than we are to care about issues that might impact future generations sometime in the future. And I mean, that's where we are with these existential risks. They're not necessarily things that will impact us in the here and now, but there is a good chance that they'll have an impact on future generations if we don't take action. But this kind of ethical discounting of things that might happen in the future, that might be a grave mistake. As Toby Ord says, and I quote, The idea that it may be a serious crime to impose risks to all living beings and to our entire future is a natural fit with the common sense ideas behind the law of human rights and crimes against humanity. There would be substantial practical challenges in reconciling this idea with the actual bodies of law, and in defining the thresholds required for prosecution. But these challenges are worth undertaking. Our descendants would be shocked to learn that it used to be perfectly legal to threaten the continued existence of humanity. So that's where I want to leave things off with some food for thought. Do you think that there might one day be a future that looks back on this time and sees the perpetuation of existential risks as a crime against humanity? Do you think future generations might look back at us and be appalled in the same way that we're appalled when we see genocide and slavery today? I'll leave that an open-ended question. Thank you everyone for listening to this episode of the Bad Philosopher Podcast. And for anyone who's enjoying this series so far on existential risk, I would be grateful if you'd consider becoming a paying member or a patron to help support this podcast. 
There are some perks to go with this. Um, all paying members or patrons at the $5 a month tier or higher, you get access to additional bonus content in the form of a weekly companion podcast where I talk about the latest podcast episode, I answer listener questions or comments, and I add on some additional thoughts or material as well. Generally, these companion podcasts are coming in at around the 30-minute range, and that's hopefully where I intend to keep them going forward. So, thanks again for everyone who is here listening, whether or not you do become a supporter. And I'll see you all on the next one, where we dive into part three of our series on existential risk. Stay tuned.